Hi folks, welcome to this video on player violence. So what we're this is one of the deviancy topics. So players are going to be negatively deviant when they're violent towards uh, fellow competitors. And as you, you know, you've got an example, if you look on YouTube, you'll see this example of this uh, girl in the US soccer player, unbelievably violent in a particular game, multiple incidents there of, uh, <coughs> excuse me, of violence. See, pulling the back of an opponent's ponytail to drag her down even. So let's get a couple of little brief definitions to start with. So we can say that player violence can either be spontaneous or premeditated. So spontaneous, exactly what you'd expect it to be. There's just a sudden outburst. Something's happened and bang, you've just acted violently towards someone. Premeditated is often, you know, it's planned. It's often when you've had history. You know you're going to be violent towards someone as a tactic or just because you're hostile and you don't like them. So there are a couple of uh, key definitions of it. I suppose the next thing to answer on this is what are the causes, often cited as the causes of player violence. Well, going back to a bit of psychology, you know, trait aggression. We all have a trait, okay, a characteristic for aggression. And we often view sport as a way to release that. You know, it's that word again, catharsis. Um, we see, you know, the sporting arena as a suitable place to release any aggression that's built up inside of us. So, you know, trait aggression, naturally having an aggressive gene, is obviously going to be a cause of player violence. Secondly, we've got that frustration, again, being blocked from achieving our goals, you know, frustration, aggression theory, being outplayed, um, you know, someone marking you out the game, <coughs> excuse me, got a bit of a sore throat, and stopping you from effectively performing as well as you know you can. There's also an element of this, you lose your identity when you're part of a group, so weirdly, I'm no longer responsible for my actions, it's not me being violent. It's, it's the group being violent, the team being violent. So we tend to do, we lose our individuality when we're part of a group, so we think we can get away with more. And that's something called de individuation or de individualization. You know, we try and lose, we always, we think psychologically we lose our individual personality when we're part of a group, so we're no longer responsible for our individual actions. It comes up time and time again social learning. Are you learning to be violent by watching and copying other violent people, particularly if the role model? that you have is, you know, has aspects of aggression within their performance. Um, so that's part of it. And there's one more I forgot to add, a little arrow that I'm going to add now. And it's that one there. Your role in the team, you may be the enforcer, the one who's supposed to put in a few hard tackles early on to set your team's tempo, to, to show the opposition what you're going to be playing like for this game. You know, the hard man, the hard girl of the team, something like that. So that may also lead you to be violent, to overstep the mark, you know, stop being assertive and start being aggressive. So there, you know, the two definitions or the two different types of player violence that we talk about, and there are five common causes. So if we've got causes, we must have solutions. So what are the solutions to player violence? Well, there are three, as I say, people, there are other things, wrong, wrong terminology, whichever, but there are three structures of, of, of dealing with violent players, and that's things that the players themselves can use, there's coaching strategies and there's things that national governing bodies can use. So let's quickly first have a look at what national governing bodies can do. Right then, so the role of national governing bodies in dealing with violent players. Well, let's come here first. They can obviously use experienced officials. Now, there's an, another way of saying something else here. Not only have they got to be experienced officials, but we can also train officials in defusing situations. So when it starts to kick off, you know, some training where they can get the body in between the right people without harming themselves and things like that. But, you know, certain types of language they should use or shouldn't use. So training them in how to diffuse the situation. National governing bodies can also push non-violent role models, okay? Set, get your role models, the people who are promoting your sport, get them out there. Something that's very big in rugby, putting people on report and using video evidence to review a decision. Okay, so maybe I missed it live, like an eye gouging incident or something like that. I can then get the, the um, fourth official to have a look and even then if I'm not satisfied, I can put that player on report to review it after the game. Um, something that's very big at the minute, bringing sports law in line with common law, i.e. if I punch someone on a rugby pitch or a football pitch or anywhere on a basketball court, I'm going to be charged the same as if I punched that person on the street. For too long, we've seen the sports venue as a separate area where you can get away with that. Well, let's bring sports law in line with common law. And we are seeing more of that, more prosecutions coming in. And we can also award fair play awards for uh, players, performers, teams who have very good disciplinary records who show no levels of violence. So what can coaches do? What can coaches do in reducing violence in their players, in their performers? Well, coaches... 
you know, the coach is responsible for setting a good example. They're the leader of that squad, of that group. So setting a good example, setting a culture, a culture of non-violence. We play hard, but we play fair, things like that. Alongside that, setting up a strict code of conduct. Here's how we behave. Here's how we conduct ourselves. And that's obviously linked to your culture. This is the way that we play. Um, and that can be, you know, that has to be in a non-violent way. But those players that are violent, we punish them. Ban them, find them, suspend them, drop them for the next game, something like that. We can promote anxiety control techniques, mental rehearsal imagery, censoring, all those kind of techniques that we've mentioned in controlling anxiety. This one's a contentious one for me. Any coach that avoids a win-at-all-costs mentality ends up losing their job quite quickly. However, it's correct theory. If you avoid that win at all costs, do what you can, you know, that Lombardian ethic, do what you can to win. You've got to try and avoid that to a certain extent so that you reduce the violence levels within players. But else, what can we do? We can substitute or change tactics. If a player is being violent, we can substitute them and bring them off. You know, if we think they're going to get sent off any, anyway, excuse me, or simbind or something like that, we can bring them off ourselves and it saves our team being sent down by a player. Okay. And finally then, what can players do? There's a lot of overlap here between what coaches can do as well. So let's have a look at this to finish off with. So there's a bit of overlap in terms of what the players can do. Again, we can use what the strategy that the national governing bodies can do. We can use positive role models, give ourselves a non-violent positive role model. We also need to avoid personal situations that lead to violence. I.e., if you know that going into this situation, you're going to lose your head and kick off and it's going to lead to a fight and you get involved, walk away. I know it's difficult to do, but walk away from it. Take a few deep breaths and walk away. And that leads on to that other one. You know, take a few deep breaths, that's your centering, isn't it? Your anxiety control techniques again. So the coaches can push the anxiety control techniques, but the players can actively use them as well. So that's another strategy. And, it, and also as well, linked to the coaches, the coach sets the code of conduct and the national governing body sets the rules. Well, as players, we've got to follow them. Simple as that. Follow the rules and follow the code of conduct, you shouldn't ever get accused of being violent. Simple as that. So there are various strategies that we can do with dealing with violence in and amongst players. Hope you found this video useful, folks.